Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to continue our series titled Broken. And what we're doing is we're looking at Hebrews chapter 11, and this is God's hall of fame. These are all the great men and women of the Bible. And in this chapter, one of the things that's very clear is every one of these people was in some way or another broken. And, and God healed their broken lives. And also the encouraging thing for this pastor is that God can use broken people. I don't know about you, but that gives me hope. That if God could use these people who had sin and problems and issues in their life, then maybe God can use me and maybe God can use you as well. And we're coming down to the end of this chapter. We've been looking at each one of these individuals, looking at what it was broken in their lives and how God healed them and how God used them. And if you look at chapter 11 and look at verse number 32, it says, and what shall I more say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. See, the, the writer comes down to the end of the chapter and realizes I, I can't I can't go into every one. I just don't have time. There's too many people I could talk about. And so at the end of the chapter, he just kind of lists out a, a group of names. And, and we've looked at these different names. And the last one in the list there is Samuel. Samuel. Now, I don't know what you know about Samuel or not, but if you'll turn in the Old Testament, the book of 1 Samuel, okay? And if you have any trouble finding 1 Samuel, it's right before 2 Samuel. And then it's also right before 1 and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles. So you find all the 1 and 2 you're going to find it real easily there. So 1 Samuel chapter 4. Now, we looked a little bit at Samuel last week and talked about him as a child. Uh, remember, Hannah was barren, and she prayed to God to give her a child. And she said, if you'll give me a child, I'll give him back to you. And so after Samuel's born, after he was weaned, then she gave him to, the, to, be, to be a servant in the temple of Eli. And, and that's where Samuel first heard from God, and he heard the voice of God and didn't know who it was. And, and, uh, and, and we talked about Samuel, and, and, to, and the title of our message last week was, I don't want to hear what you don't want to tell me. And sometimes we don't want to hear the truth, but we need to hear the truth truth, and we need to hear from God. And, and now as we look at Samuel, I want you to look at 1 Samuel chapter 4, look at verse number 19, and it says, and his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child. Now, this is not Samuel's daughter-in-law, this is Eli's daughter-in-law, was with child, near to be delivered, and when she heard the tidings of the ark of God was taken, that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman that stood by her said unto her, fear not. For thou hast borne a son, but she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. Now the word Ichabod means no glory. And what had happened is Eli was so wicked that God judged the nation of Israel. Eli was the priest at that time, and his sons were wicked and vile. And, and, and God judged Israel, and the Philistines came in and attacked them. And, and, and they thought that, well, what, when, what we can do is we can take the ark of God into battle. And, and they were looking at an object as being where the power of God was. Because this was the, the focus, this was the portable temple, so to speak, the portable altar. And, and so they were going to take it. When he first brought it to battle, the Philistines were scared because they knew that the, the Jews God, the Hebrew God, was a powerful God. But yet they defeated Israel and they were able to take the ark. And then it's, a, it's an interesting story to read how God brought the ark back to Israel later on in this, in this book as well. And if you've not read it, I encourage you to do it. But at that point of time, Israel is probably one of the lowest points that they'd ever been. In fact, the Bible uses the word Ichabod. The glory of God is gone. It, it, the, the, we, we've lost the, our relationship with the Lord, and they were at a low spot. But fortunately, they had the, the prophet Samuel. Samuel was probably one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament and uh, was a great man of God. And you go through First and Second Samuel, read about all that he did for the Lord. It's an amazing study. But let me talk, first of all, about Samuel the person. Okay, I want you to realize he lived in a time where Ichabod, the glory, all this started happening, and he was the one who had to kind of guide the people back to God. Okay, so look at 1 Samuel chapter 12. Let's find out what we can about Samuel the person. 1 Samuel chapter 12, and look at verse number 2. 1 Samuel 12, verse 2. And now behold, the king walketh before you, and I am old and gray-handed. This is Samuel speaking, gray-headed. And behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from a childhood unto this day. 
So he's just basically saying, you know me. He's looking at the people and saying, you know me, you, you see me all these years. And then verse number three, behold, here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed, whose ox have I taken, or whose ass have I taken, or whom have I defrauded, whom I have oppressed, of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith, and I will restore it unto you. And they said, thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. And he said unto them, the Lord is witness against you and is known as witness this day that you have not found aught in my hand. And they answered, he is a witness. So he stood before the people, says, you know me, you know my character. And the people said, we do. He was a man of character. We, we, the Bible would term he's a man of integrity. Uh, hold your place in 1 Samuel, go over to Psalms chapter 26, Psalms chapter 26, and beginning with verse number one, Psalms chapter 26 and verse number one. Now, this is David speaking. He says, judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins in my heart, for thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with disassemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocency, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell all of thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, and whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity, redeem me, and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place, in the congregations will I bless the Lord. I want to give you a challenge for this week. If you don't do devotions, if you do, I'd like to challenge you to take Psalms chapter 26 this week and go through it verse by verse and ask yourself this question. Am I a man or am I a woman of integrity? You see, this is what this whole chapter is about. What does it mean to be a man or a woman of integrity? Samuel was a man of integrity. The Bible describes him that way as a man of integrity. So what are the characteristics of integrity? There's many different ones. We'll just mention a couple of them here from this passage. First of all, someone who has integrity walks in the truth. Look at verse number one. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. And then look at verse three. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. So a man or a woman of integrity walks in God's truth. Galatians chapter five, verses 16 and 17 said, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And these are the contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Verse 25, if we live in the spirit, let's also walk in the spirit. What does it mean to walk in the spirit? It means you're, as you move forward, you're going in the right direction. You're following the truth. You're following God's way in your life. You're walking in the spirit. And, and Samuel was a man who walked in truth. He was a man that walked in the spirit and not in the flesh. Also look at verses four and five. He says, I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with disassemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. The, the man of God, the man of integrity, the woman of integrity will, is separated from the world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17, it says, Wherefore, come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. See, he says, I'm not going to sit down with those that are disassemblers. I'm not going to sit down with those that are wicked. You know, in today's world, where do we sit down with people like that? On the internet, on the TV, in places like that. But the man and woman of integrity says, that's not what I want to be a part of. That's not the kind of people I want influencing my life. That's not the kind of people I want to sit down with. And, and then another factor, look at verses 6 through 8. He says, I will wash mine hands in innocency, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord. The word compass there is, is, it basically means that the altar is the center of my life. The altar is the center of my life. Verse number seven, that I may publish with the voices of thanksgiving and tell all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. See, someone that's a woman or a man of integrity, they love to be in church. 
They love to be around God's people. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 25, it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more is to see the day approaching. If you're a man, if you're a woman of integrity, you're going to make the, the place of God, the altar of God, the center of your life, that put God at the center point of your life. If you're a man or a woman of integrity, you, you're going to love being in church and love being around God's people and take every opportunity you have to, to be there. In Proverbs chapter 11, at verse number three, it says, the integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. You know, this idea of this word compass, again, I mentioned this the other week in another message, you know, a, a compass is not only where it has north, south, east, and west on it, but a compass is also, if you remember from probably junior high years or upper elementary, you remember how you had to have a compass for that year's math? Remember how that was, the little V-shape with the pointy end on one end, the pencil on the other, the, the little thing that you guys used to poke your neighbors and your, your friends and, and harass them with it? You know, and what do you do with that compass? You put the point down, and then you can draw a circle or, or right around that point. You put the compass at the center of the circle, and, and God wants to be at the center of your life that he is that the center guide of your life, that you can pass the altar. So a man of integrity, a woman of integrity, they walk in the truth of God's word. They, they're separated from the world and the wickedness of the world. They, they love to go to church. These are some of the characteristics. Now, again, I would challenge you, take this passage and go through it this week, verse by verse, and think about every word and every thought and ask yourself, am I a man? Am I a woman of integrity? And meditate upon that throughout that day as well, because there's much more we can gain from this passage if we had time. But here's something that challenges me and encourages me. If you look again, this is David speaking, and he says in verse number, verse number two, he says, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins in my heart. In verse one, he says, I have walked in my integrity. He says, God, examine my life. He, he said, God, look at me. I'm a man of integrity. But wait a minute. Do you know who David is? David was the, the shepherd the killer of Goliath. David was the king of Israel, but he was also a murderer and adulterer. In 1 Kings chapter 9 and verse number 4, it's one thing for David to say, I'm a man of integrity. I, I've had a lot of people tell me that they're really, a, you know, they're a good person. And I look at it and say, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, it's, some people can fool themselves, can't they? Now, David at this point, I, I think he was being honest. This was early on in his life, and I believe at this point in his life that really he was trying to live for the Lord, and it was before his sin of murder and adultery, and, and I, I really believe at that point he saw himself as a man of integrity. But then later on, that wasn't so true. I think he kind of lost his integrity by the things that he did. But here's what encourages me. In 2 Kings chapter 9 and verse 4, this is after our first Kings, I'm sorry, first Kings 9, 4. This is after David's dead. And God is speaking to one of his great, great grandchildren. And he says this, and if thou will walk before me as David thy father walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee and will keep my statutes and my judgments. Wow. God called David a man of integrity, even after what he did. Now, does that mean he was okay with God? No. David paid a very big price for what he did. He suffered the consequences of his sin, but he repented. He got it right with God. Read Psalms chapter 51. He repented of his sin. He said, God, I, I did this. It was me. He took full responsibility. He repented. He got right with God. Now, what's interesting is this is after Psalms 26, David never again talks about himself as being a man of integrity because he knew his heart. The Bible says our heart is deceitfully wicked above all things, desperately wicked, who can know it. He, he knew his heart. And he knew, man, I, I'd messed up. I, I, I'm not as good as I thought I was. You know, folks, the older I get, the more I realize how bad I really am. We, we think we got life all figured out when we're younger, and then we realize that I'm not quite as good as I thought I was, and I've got a long way to go. And God began to work in David's heart, and David got right with God and got right with others, but 
He never called himself a man of integrity again. But God did. That's the grace of God. That's why I love Hebrews chapter 11. Is every one of these men and every one of these women, they messed up. But God said they're still great men and great women. God still used them when they repented and got right with him. And so Samuel, he was a, a man of integrity. But also, Samuel was also known as a man of prayer. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 7 and look at verse number 9. 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse number 9. 1 Samuel 7, 9, And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. So Samuel prayed, and God heard him. Now, do you always feel like God hears your prayers? I don't know about you. There's a lot of times I pray, I feel like I'm praying to the ceiling. Sometimes I, say, I, I think it says, saying, dear God, I say, dear ceiling. You ever feel like that? You ever feel like, does God really hear my prayers? But Samuel was a man that as you go through and read about his life, God heard his prayers. In fact, Samuel considered a sin not to pray. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 19. 1 Samuel chapter 19. You know what's interesting? Uh, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 19. 1 Samuel 12, 19. What's interesting is that Samuel's name means heard of God. That's what his name means. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, in verse number 19, it says, And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. Are there certain people you want praying for you? There are just certain people. I, I, I'm thankful for everybody that prays for me. But if I'm sick or something's going on in my life, there's about a dozen people I will call on the phone and say, can you please pray for me? Because those are people that know how to pray. Those are people that have a challenge and a heart for prayer. Those are people that know how to get a hold of God. And that's the kind of person Samuel. The people said, Samuel, we need you to pray for us. Look down at verse number 23. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, for I will teach you the good and the right way. Uh, if you know the story here, what happened is the people were rejecting Samuel, and they said, we want a king. And Samuel said, well, you don't need a king. It's, you know, and he tried to talk him out of it, but they said, no, we want a king. And then when they got the king, they realized, we made a mistake here. Now, Samuel could have been mad and said, I'm not praying for you guys. You're a bunch of losers. You're, you rejected me. You, you go off on your own and deal with it however you want to. But he didn't do that. He says, it's a sin if I don't pray for you. Do you consider it a sin if you don't pray for others? Do you pray every day for others? Are you heard of God? See, God calls him a man of prayer. In Psalms chapter 99 and verse number 6, it says, Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among them that call upon his name, they called upon the Lord, he answered them. God named three people and said, when they called, I answered. You know, I, I, uh, sometimes I have a love-hate relationship with a cell phone, don't you? But one of the things I love about a cell phone is I know who's calling. And the other day, I, you know, I get calls, and, and my cell phone says, it's probably a scam call. <laughs> that one's going away. I'm not even going to bother answering that one. And then, oh, that's my wife. Yeah, I better answer that. Or that's so, and so, oh, I don't want to talk to him now. I'll, I'll call him back later, you know. It's, you know, sometimes I don't always answer the phone. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Okay, now next time you call me, if I don't answer, don't think I'm not answering you. I'm busy, okay? But anyway, I, I don't always answer the phone when somebody calls. Well, I, I'm not going to talk to them right now. But God said, you, these guys, when they call, I'm listening. They, they were men, and one of them was a man of prayer was Samuel was a man of prayer. In Jeremiah 15, 1, listen again. Then said the Lord unto me, though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be towards this people. Cast them out of my sight, let them go forth. He said, I won't even listen to Samuel. That's how bad it is. So in the Bible, God says there's two people. If anybody, if I'm going to listen to anybody pray, it's two people. And that is, it's Moses and Samuel. And even in this case, I'm not going to listen to them. So that's a great testimony. Are, are you known as a man or a woman of prayer? Can you honestly look people in the eye every Sunday and say, listen, I prayed for you this week. Can you, can you honestly say that I pray every day? 
Are you a man or a woman of prayer? Third thing about Samuel I see is that he was a servant. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 1. The very first time we meet Samuel, he's, he's serving in the temple. 1 Samuel 3, 1, the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord is precious in those days. There was no open vision. He ministered. He served. He was a servant. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant who was made in the likeness of man. Do you serve others? See, a lot of people come to church like they're going to a restaurant. When I go in the restaurant, I don't go in the kitchen and cook the food. I, I don't go to the t- take the order at the table. I don't go in the back and wash the dishes. I sit down and expect somebody else to serve me. But Samuel, he was a servant. Do you come to serve God and to serve others? See, Samuel was a great man of God because he was a man of integrity. Are you a man or a woman of integrity? Could you say, look at my life and see how I live? Samuel was a man of prayer. Are you a man or a woman of prayer? And Samuel was a man that was a servant to others. But Samuel wasn't perfect. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 8. The worst thing we know about Samuel's life is this. He was a great prophet, but he wasn't a great dad. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, beginning with verse number 1, it says, And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah, and they were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in the ways in thy ways now. Make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said it, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. One of the reasons that Israel wanted a king is because they're looking at Samuel's son and we said, We don't want them. Samuel, as great a man of God as he was, as great a prophet that he was, he was a lousy father. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 7, says, The just man walketh in his integrity, his children are blessed after him. You ever known some great Christians that had terrible kids? There's a reason. Maybe they weren't quite as great as they thought. Now, I realize there's a lot of reasons why kids turn away from the Lord, and a lot of reasons children get away from God. But I believe in this case, Samuel was responsible. And what I want to challenge you is this. You can be great in your career and lose your children. You can be a great Christian and still be a lousy father or a lousy mother. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1 says, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Do you know what Samuel's children's name meant? Joel means Jehovah is God. Abiai means worshiper of God. Samuel started right. He wanted his kids to be worshipers of God and the hope of the Lord. He wanted them to look to God as their God. But he never taught it to them. Now, Samuel should have known better. Because remember back in 1 Samuel chapter 3, when we first read about Samuel? What did God revealed to him in that vision. He revealed to him, Eli is going to be judged of me because his children turned out so bad. So you think Samuel would have said, man, I don't want that to happen to my kids. And I think maybe there was a little bit of he thought, well, I'm better than Eli, and he was. But he still failed in his job to be the right kind of father. In fact, Saul the king that was chosen turned out to be a kind of a bad king, remember? But his son turned out better than Samuel's sons. Samuel was the good one of the two, but Saul's son turned out and Samuel's didn't. If you got this idea just because you go to church or just because your kids go to Christian school that they're going to turn out right, get rid of that idea real quick. 
Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 says, And you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Parents, it's not automatic. You can be a great Christian. You can serve the Lord and still lose your kids. It's good to be a man or woman of integrity. It's good to be a man or woman of prayer. It's good to have a heart of a servant. But don't neglect your family. Now, Samuel could have looked at it and said, well, they're not as bad as Eli's kids were. Eli's kids, they not only were corrupt, but they were laying with the women in the church. They were not restrained. Folks, we're not out to raise good kids. We want to raise godly kids. Kids that love the Lord. Titus 2.12, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. See, Samuel knew the word of God. He was the prophet. But he did not teach it to his children. In Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, do not depart from it. You need to teach your children the word of God. It's not automatically going to happen. It's not just because they come to Sunday school, because they come to church, because they go to a Christian school. You have to teach it to them. When they rise up, when they lay down, when they're walking by the way, it's the little teaching. The word train up here is kind of the picture. Have you ever seen a bonsai tree? You ever see how they take those and they shape them in a certain shape? Now, there's two things they do. First of all, they're, they're, they have to, the person doing that has to realize there's a bend to that tree. You can't make that tree go against this bend. In other words, if it's growing this way, you can't force it to grow that way. You can shape it, but you can't force it. And one of the things you have to do with every one of your children is realize that they have a bend. They have a personality. They have a certain direction that they were born with. And you have to find out what that is. Now, they're all born with a sin nature. And that's one of the things we struggle with. But what is their bend? What is it? And how can I take that child as an individual and, and guide them and shape them the way that God wants them to grow? And the other thing with bonsai, and this is where I feel, I, I, we have a wall behind our house, and on top of that wall is a lot of weeds, and so I thought, well, I'll plant some bougainville, because bougainville looks so beautiful. But the thing I fail to realize is if you don't trim bougainville regularly, it gets out of control. You have to do a lot of small cuts, because when you wait for the big cuts, you're going to get in there, and it's going to cut you. I've got scars all over me from that bougainville when we had a little bit of a hassle together. It's the little cuts every day that teach your children and guide them. And Samuel didn't do that. He knew the word of God, but he didn't teach it to his children. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it talks about Timothy, that from a child that was known the scriptures. Folks, let's not just raise kids that know the Bible stories. Let's raise kids that know the Bible, that know what they believe and why, that they see it in your life and they're hearing it from your voice. But more importantly, they need to see you live it. When Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, he says, let me, let me remind you about your mother and your grandmother, how godly they were. See, he could tell you, Timmy, look at your godly mom. Look at your godly mother. That's the example you want to live by. And I wonder, can your children look at your life and say, that's the kind of person that I want to be? Are you setting an example for them? Too often we as parents do as I say, not as I do. You know, one of the best young men in the Bible was Timothy. Amazing young man. Do you know he was raised by basically a single mom? See, let's get rid of our excuses and live a godly life that our children can follow. The scriptures are going to make thee wise unto salvation. John chapter 5 and verse 39 says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify me. Your kids aren't saved because they were born into your family. They're not saved because they go to church. They're not saved because they do, are doing good things. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and then not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we need to make sure that our children understand that salvation is by grace through faith. 
and that they come to that point that they make it a personal decision. Too many children grow up and, and, and they reject their parents' faith because they've never made it their faith. Being raised in the Christian home doesn't make you a Christian. Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised the dead, thou shalt be saved. With the heart man believeth in the righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I had my start point class this morning. I was telling the people in the class that when I grew up, we, we're, we moved a lot. And every time we moved, my, my mom would find the closest church, and that's where we'd go to church. I was baptized as an infant in the Catholic church. I was catechized in Lutheran and Presbyterian churches. I, I went to everything you could imagine. And one day, my mom, the closest church was a Baptist church. My mom went, and she got saved. And she went forward, and, and she, she got baptized. She got baptized. And when she went forward, I went with her. I wasn't going to be left by myself. I was seven years old. When I got up there, they said, why'd you come? And I said, same reason my mom came. Figured she was doing it. That was good enough for me. And so they baptized me, but I wasn't saved because I'd never called upon the Lord in my own heart. And it wasn't until I was 14 years old that I realized I need to ask Jesus to be my Savior. And what about you? Have you called upon Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? You're not a Christian because you're good. You're a Christian because you have Christ. I wonder if Samuel disciplined his children. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse number 35. 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse number 35. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Um, 1 Samuel 15, 35. So Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he made Saul king of Israel. That's um, not the verse I want. I apologize for that. But the point is that Samuel, I don't think, disciplined his children in love the way he should have. And as a pastor, I've seen this in my own children, and I've seen this in other people's children. You know, I see two extremes. Either we don't discipline them at all, or we discipline them harshly and in anger rather than love. We need to discipline Eli did not discipline his children. He did not rebuke them when they were wrong. And we, we've got to discipline our children, but we need to do it in love. In Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible taught, turn over there, Hebrews chapter 12, look at verses 5 through 11. Hebrews chapter 12, and begin with verse number 5. You've forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My sin despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, the spanking, so to speak, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But it be without chastisement, where, where of all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Boy, that's strong language. When I was a kid, if I said that word bastard, I got my mouth washed out with soap. But he's trying to make a point here. If you don't have Christ as your Savior, then God's not your Father. But if God is your Father and you have Christ as your Savior, He chastises those whom He loves. And parents, you need to discipline your children, but to do it love. Oh, they're going to get a spanking. And there's a time where your child needs a spanking, but they need to know that you love them. And you do it not out of anger but out of love. Are you a parent that just lets your children get away with everything and never, never rebukes them and never, or like Eli, Eli would say, don't do that, don't do that, but he never did anything about it. That's wrong. But are you also maybe the parent that when you discipline your children, it's, it's out of anger and it's not out of love and it's not out of example to them? Find that balance. Find the balance of loving your children enough to discipline them. But more importantly, loving them enough to teach them, to disciple them as well. In 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse number 8. 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse number 8. If there's one thing I think the biggest mistake that Samuel made was he was too busy for his kids. 
1 Samuel 13, 8, and he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed, but Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. You read about Samuel's life, he was always busy. He was busy serving the Lord, but maybe too busy for his kids. Maybe you've gotten too busy at work, or you've gotten too busy with your hobbies, or you've gotten too busy with even serving the Lord. I look back at my life, and I regret some of the time that I spent at church when I should have been with my children, and I can't go back and do that again. I can't do overs. You know, the first mention of Samuel's kids is not till chapter 12. We didn't even know he had kids. And I wonder if he just didn't have time for them. Make time for your kids. Make time for your children so 20 years from now, when you gather as a family, they're going to look back and say, hey, you remember when we went camping together? Or remember when we used to go on that pizza night every Friday night? Or remember when we... And give them memories of time with you as a family. And give them memories of time serving the Lord together as a family. Ephesians 5.16 says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. You know, I realize how hard it is sometimes to spend time with your kids. Some of you in the military, you're deployed, you're working duty days and all the rest of it. But folks, you got to make time. You got to redeem the time. So often we're, we say, I don't have time, but we come home, what do we do? We sit and watch TV or we play video games. We're doing everything else but spending time with our children. And Samuel was a great man of God, but he lost his kids. Finally, I want to talk about Samuel the prophet as we close. Acts chapter 13, verse 20 says, And after that he gave, them on, gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And, and it tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 3 that the vision was precious in those days. And Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. We need people in our lives that are prophets. Not to tell us the future, but to say, thus saith the Lord. That's why it's so important to be here in church every week. Because you need people that are going to stand up and tell you the truth whether you want to hear it or not. They're going to stand up and tell you what God has to say and open the word of God with you. Samuel's message was a message of repentance in 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse number 3. It says, And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you do not return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and a straw from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So listen, if you want God's blessings, you got to repent. What does the word repent mean? It means I'm going the wrong way and I'm going to turn around and go the right way. Now, some of you are thinking, well, I'm not that bad. Listen, if I'm trying to go this way and instead I'm going that way, the further I go, the more off track I get the further I get from the right way. You don't have to be going 180 degrees out to go the wrong way. You can go 90 degrees. You can go 45 degrees. You can go one degree and still not be right. You got to repent and get back on the path. And then the second message in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Saul had disobeyed God. And Samuel says this in verse number 22. He says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than a sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of the rams. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. Saul had done something wrong. Samuel said, Saul had tried to justify it, say, well, I, I did it for the Lord. I, I did it for the people. And God said, what you did was wrong. Now, it sounds like Saul repented, but he didn't. He excused himself. Well, the, the people's fault. They made me do it. I did this for the Lord. He really never repented of his sin. And, and Saul said, listen, to obey is better than sacrifice. 
Maybe today there's someone in this room that you need to obey God. You need to get right with God. You need to do the right thing. We're going to close with 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. And verses 6 to 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 6. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected me, they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, and so do, do they also unto thee. When they rejected Samuel, now remember, Samuel had part responsibility here. His kids weren't ready to take over. He hadn't trained them. He hadn't prepared them. And maybe if his kids were better kids, they would have never wanted a king. I don't know. But they rejected not Samuel. They rejected God. And I want to challenge you today. Don't reject what God is trying to say to you. Ask yourself this question. Can I honestly say I'm a man or a woman of integrity? Now, I'll tell you the truth. The older you get, the harder it is to say that because you realize how much you've messed up in your life. But I'm thankful that I have a God that forgives. And I can say, God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me and get right with God. And so can you. Are you a man or a woman of prayer? Are you somebody that I would want to call on the phone and say, would you pray for me? Because you are here to heard of God. Are you a servant? And those of you that are parents here today, do not let your kids grow up and have your heart break because they did not live for the Lord. Now, you can try to blame the Christian school and you can try to blame the church, but ultimately it comes down to you. You've got to spend time with them. You've got to make memories with them. You've got to teach them the truth of God's word. You've got to set the example for their lives. Tonight, maybe there's somebody in this room who needs to repent. Maybe there's somebody in this room who needs to obey.